you very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation. Um, yes, this is um, on several joint projects with uh, Adria uh, Brochier, Lukas Müller, and indirectly also Christoph Schweigert on, um, on an operatic uh, approach to modular functors and similar objects using factorization homology that yeah, is supposed to lead up to the uh, classification of, of modular functors. So let's maybe start by giving an informal definition of what a modular functor is. So um, a modular functor is a system of representations of mapping class groups of surfaces and surfaces for us are always compact and they are also oriented. So I'm not gonna say that anymore. This will be implicit. And um, yeah, representations on, 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 on what? So it will be on, yeah, in the, in the traditional sense, uh, vector spaces, but in, in principle on, uh, on anything that, that makes sense. And this uh, system is compatible with gluing. And this, um, this notion in its, its uh, various, also sometimes inequivalent forms that, that appear, this is due to uh, Siegel, uh, Toral, Bakalov, Kirillov, uh, Moore, Seiberg, and, and others. And again, there are different uh, definitions of this object, and I will give one definition later that is a bit more precise. Before that, I want to draw a picture also. So this is how this looks like. This is what we here. So this is our surface, sigma, and then we will have boundary labels, and I'm gonna formalize this later. And then we assign to this a vector space, depending on these labels. Just rephrasing what, what I wrote there. This comes with an action of the mapping class group of the uh, surface, and then this vector space is often referred to as a conformal block for that surface. So there are different flavors of this and um, you, can, you can do your favorite uh, version in the version that, that we discussed here is, the, is um, so we will have um, a parametrization of the boundary, and it's supposed to to uh, preserve this. But you can have, um, you can of course have. Um, I mean, you can map from one parametrization to a different parametrization. But the automorphisms in the surface category, there will be these pure mapping class groups. So, uh, um, that's yes. Um, I mean. This parametrization, when you define this correctly, this you, you could also phrase this by um, using these marked points or these extended surfaces that Bakalov and Kirillov use. Yes, you, you can also do that. This is more or less equivalent. Yeah. Okay. Then let's work towards a slightly more sophisticated definition um, using modular operats. Modular operats and their algebras. So 
So for the precise definition, we use modular operats and more specifically, the modular operat surf oops, of surfaces. So I will not say too many things on, on the general theory of cyclic and modular operats. I, I will dive right in and will define for you this modular operat of surfaces and then I will draw a picture that somehow illustrates the general idea behind this. So the binary operations in this surface operat, this is the groupoid of compact oriented surfaces with n plus one parametrized boundary components. Why is it n plus one, even though here is an n, this is because one of them is to be thought of as the output, but this is going to be a, a cyclic opera in particular. So there is no distinction really between the inputs and the outputs and this is a pure convention. If you want to write n plus one here, you can also do this. It's, it depends a little bit on what arity means uh, for you. As a space, and uh, this is just um, both of all genera and it's just uh, map classifying spaces of mapping class uh, groups of uh, surfaces with the uh, appropriate number of boundary components. And yeah, so this is a, a modular uh, operat in the sense of uh, Getzler and, and Kapranov. And in fact, this, I mean, the, the very word modular in modular operat refers actually to this, this is the thing that they had in mind when, when they came up with this definition. So what modular operat means is that it is, um, yeah, it's not only an operat, it is also a, a cyclic operat. So we have a consistent way of cyclically permuting inputs and outputs. And in a modular operat, we also have self compositions of operations. So here's a picture. illustration of composition in a modular operand. So you, you can give yourself two operations. I call them O and O prime. So they have a certain, uh, a certain arity. So I, I might draw something in arity three, and then it for an operat, you would draw it like this, but since this is in particular a cyclic operat, we don't do that. So we would draw this just like this. And somehow, which leg is the output for you or whether you want to have a designated output at all, this is somehow up to you, yeah? So it has just these four legs. And then maybe this one has these two. And then we can, we can compose this in different ways. And, and one composition that we might have uh, is gonna look like this. So here are these two, here are these four. And then we can do things like this. We can join these. So this, um, this corresponds to plugging this into this, but we draw it just a little bit differently because we have just here these, these inputs, and then we can also do things like this. We can somehow trace operations. And so this can be formalized using 
Costello's graph category. So he has different graph categories and symmetric monoidal truncus out of this. They describe for you modular operats, cyclic operats, or just ordinary operats. Um, I, I will not dis discuss this here. It's not going to be too critical, but it's a very, um, I think, a very elegant description of, um, of this. Okay. So if we are given a category valued modular operat O, think of O as surf, if you like, um, we can define modular algebras over O with values in any symmetric monoidal by category S. So why, why symmetric monoidal by category? So the thing is that, so we will have category valued modular uh, operats or groupoid valued once, and then we can use that every symmetric monoidal um, uh, by category is enriched over cut. And then this is what you use to, def to define an endomorphism of, uh, of an object, and then you can define modular algebras in a very natural way. This is not the only thing that you do. Of course, you can also do this in, um, in an infinity category, if 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 you, yeah, I mean, you can you can do this. We're not going to do this. Yeah. So for us, um, we we really want to define a modular function in a way that is reasonably close to what is traditionally understood by it. But yeah, you can do different things. So we define this um, as an object x. For us, it's um, yes. For us, it's a it is a groupoid. Um, you could you could uh, also use somehow really the the diffeomorphisms. The difference is is uh, rather small, but of course there is a difference. And uh, yeah, for us, it's it's really just this. We, we want, just want to talk really about mapping class groups for the moment. And uh, yeah, the thing that we're doing here actually uh, allows us to also make some statements about actions of diffeomorphism groups somehow um, indirectly, but yeah, th the way that it is defined here, this is really just groupoid uh, valued or an, yeah, an aspherical topological operat, if you, if you like. Um, so this, yeah, so the modular algebra, this is an object X with a symmetric non-degenerate pairing kappa this is the monoidal product in s this is the unit in s non-degenerate pairing means that it is a one morphism like this that exhibits x as its own dual in the homotopy category of the symmetric monoidal by category and symmetric means that, yeah, it's, it's symmetric up to coherent um, isomorphism. Plus, a map A from O to the endomorphism operat of this X and this kappa. This is defined in a very similar way to the usual endomorphism operats that you know, but you need this pairing to make this endomorphism operat uh, cyclic or even modular, but this is this is somehow this is uh, standard. Yeah, I mean, if you you can do this also in vector spaces, and then if you um, if you want to define what an associative um, algebra is, then you can do this on a just on a on a vector space. If you want to say what a cyclic 
um, associative algebra, so if uh, Frobenius uh, algebra, then you need a pairing because you need to make the endomorphism operat of this object uh, cyclic. Yeah, and this is a map of uh, modular operands. So just to, oops, just to spell this out. This amounts to a prescription which translates an operation O and many legs to a one morphism like this. Yeah, so the, the operations in the opera they are being realized concretely on this uh, algebraic object. And then we can um, we can say what a modular functor is. So a modular functor with values in S. This is again our symmetric monoidal bicategory. Is an S-valued. modular surf algebra. We will later uh, slightly refine this because there is one extremely important thing uh, missing here because the, mo the modular functors that we already know, they will in most cases not feature representations of mapping class groups, but actually projective representations. So you will have to pass to uh, central extensions of the, this uh, surface operat, and I will also define later on what that really means, but you want to include this. I mean, you can also say, I, I just want to look at things that are, in a sense, anomaly free, but that kills so many examples that you don't want to do that. Okay. Let me just note this here, so later we will also include um, extensions. Okay. I said that this is a symmetric monoidal bicategory, but I should, I mean, for the, for the actual applications that we have in mind, we want this to be a, a very specific symmetric monoidal bicategory that really makes contact to all this traditional language of modular categories, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so uh, the main case is S being X, and this is the symmetric monoidal I category of, yeah, so what are the, the zero cells? They are finitely complete linear categories. And this is all over an algebraically closed field K that I will not, that I will, I will uh, suppress here. So I, you should actually maybe add this here, the subscript, but I, I, I won't. And then we have as one morphisms finitely um, co continuous continuous functors, and they are called um, they are called right exact 
Um, this does not at all imply that these categories here are, are uh, actually a billion, but we call them right exact anyway. And then two morphisms are natural transformations. And this is equipped with the, the linear Kelly product. And then there are a lot of um, different versions of this. So you might want to concentrate on a finite version of RETS where the zero states are really finite uh, linear uh, categories in the sense of Eddinghoff and collaborators. So finite linear category means that this is a, a, a linear category that as a, yeah, linearly is equivalent to finite dimensional modules over a finite dimensional algebra. You might want to do this and then you can also um, replace the right exact functors with left exact functors and you um, you uh, then also have to go to the finite version if you still want to use the linear uh, Kelly product because this is uni universal with respect to right exact functors in the finite setting is it's accidentally also universal for the left exact one so it makes sense here. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I should Maybe add one more remark because I have um, defined uh, now a modular function like this, but it's actually um, relatively unclear how this uh, relates to the picture that I, I gave here. Or maybe it is clear, but I, I want to write this this uh, um, anyway. So here's the relation to the intuitive picture. So if we are given a surface, then here in, in this picture, we don't have boundary uh, labels uh, specified, but the modular algebra, the modular surface algebra, this is going to assign to this a functor A tensor A. This is somewhat, this is our underlying object in the symmetric monoidal by category, or think of it just as a linear category. Um, and yeah, let's let's just say S is uh, Rex, and then you get here a functor to vector spaces, and then this assigns to such an object really a vector space, and that is the the, the one. So the, we we get this picture really back if we if we. Um, but of course, this is, uh, it's, it's way better to formalize it like this. Okay. Then um, I would like to give some, some uh, reasons why one is actually uh, interested in, in modular uh, functors. So reasons for the interest functors. So there are several, uh, an incomplete list, but uh, here are some reasons. So first of all, they uh, produce really, really interesting mapping class group representations. And um, so there are many results on, on this, but one, one result that, that uh, one probably has to mention here is the so-called um, asymptotic uh, faithfulness. This is a result um, by John Elegard Anderson. And so this concerns the, the following question. So it's, it's an open question whether mapping class groups are linear, so whether you can embed them in a, in a matrix algebra. And this result doesn't really uh, answer this, but it comes very uh, close. So what this, what this does is that, um, so you can ask, to what extent are these representations that come from modular functors um, 
to what extent are they faithful in certain examples? And um, Anderson exhibits a, a family of modular functors. And if you have a mapping class group element that acts trivially in, uh, in every member of this, this family, then this lies in the center of the mapping class group and except for some low genus exceptions, this means that this is a trivial element. So it is, this is what, what asymptotically faithful means. These representations, they are not faithful in, because he works in the semi-simple case and they're the inputs have finite order, so it can't be really faithful. But it's, it's somehow very, uh, it's somehow as close as you can get with these semi-simple categories that he was, was using. So this is why this is uh, a uh, yeah, very interesting result. The, the one by Anderson? Yeah, yeah, this is, pub, uh, this is published. This is uh, published in Annals of Mathematics. This is uh, this paper. There's also, I mean, so th th there's also um, a different paper by Friedman, Walker, and Wang de, who, who does it a bit differently with scaling theoretic methods. Um, this is a, a bit more heavy on, on analysis and, and, and things. So this is, at least for me, this is harder to understand and the scaling theoretic picture is f for me easier. But uh, yeah, this is more or less the same. They, they, they are more or less doing the same thing. Yeah. So modular functors, they also, um, allow us to investigate, um, interesting algebraic uh, objects, for instance, Hopf algebras. So yeah, you could also say quantum groups or vertex operator algebras. So what you what you do is that from, from these objects, very often you can build a modular functor and then you can use the methods of low dimensional topology to, to actually learn something about these objects. And one one thing that this uh, one very famous instance of this is for instance, the, the Velinde formula. So the, the modular functor uh, captures under good conditions, the fusion rules of behind these uh, representation categories. And then uh, one final thing here is that um, modular functors, they, they give you access to the correlators of a CFT. And this is something that, for instance, uh, appears very prominently in the works of uh, Fuchs, Munkel, and Schweigert. Okay. Then, time-wise, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, here are some comments on the uh, classical constructions. So, So the, the, the classical constructions, what they more or less tell us is that um, modular functors can be constructed from uh, modular categories. And this sounds a little bit tautological, but it is really not. Um, so a modular category, this is a finite linear category. It has a monoidal product, it's braided, it has a ribbon structure, and then also the braiding has to be uh, non-degenerate, which means that only the unit and finite direct sums of the unit objects are um, the objects that trivially double braid with every other object. And for me, a modular category is also not necessarily semi-simple. So it's not necessarily a modular fusion category. Semi-simplicity is not part of the definition here. If we want to do this construction, then if, then however, of course, this splits up in these two, two cases, whether it's semi-simple or not. And if, yeah, so there's the 
M. M I simple case. And this is the um, Rishitiki and Turaev construction. Nineteen ninety one. So if we have a semi simple modular category, then we can build from this a three to one dimensional topological field theory, the Rishitiki and Turaev TFT. Then we can restrict this to surfaces, and this gives us, in particular, a modular function. It gives us more, but but in particular, it gives us that. Um, and in fact, semi simple modular categories they're equivalent to three to one dimensional TFTs. And um, and there is the general case, so the non-semi-simple case. And when I when I mean non-semi-simple, then I mostly mean not necessarily semi-simple. And this is the Lubashenko construction. I mean, from the mid '90s, partly in uh, uh, also in in collaboration with uh, Majid. And um, yeah, so maybe I will postpone this example of a modular category here. Um, and yeah, so I should maybe uh, give an idea of what this, this construction uh, looks like, maybe just the, the more general one because it's very, it's very computable actually. So here, if we are in this situation, um, that our modular category is A mod and A is a ribbon factorizable Hopf algebra and the surface of genus G and for simplicity, let's let's say it's it's we're looking at a closed one. This is sent to yeah, it has to be sent to to a vector space, and we can say here very explicitly what this vector space is. So it's the hom over a from uh, the ground field, which is a module over a because of the Hopf algebra, and then we go to the G tensor power. of the dual of A with the co-adjoint action. Yeah, and this is this is in the case where um, our category is, is really modules over, uh, yeah, you could say quantum group. Um, in general, this will remain true for every um, uh, modular category. You just, so, in general, you just replace this A dual with the co adjoint action by the so called canonical co n. So there is an object in this modular category, which is this co n. So um, yeah, I will not really discuss uh, co ends, but it's, it's really the, just the um, direct sum over all of these terms where this runs over uh, all objects in the category and then you divide out by some relations. It's the appropriate uh, replacement uh, of this thing. And um, if this is a hop algebra, you can say very explicitly uh, what this is. If this comes, for instance, from a view A, it's not so easy anymore. And this is, at least in my opinion, also one of the, one of the selling points of really doing this generally and not um, distinguishing between these all these different cases where this modular category might come from. Okay. And um, yeah, just one brief comment on what this mapping class group action looks like. So let's maybe just take G equals to one 
then we have just this. So, so yeah, maybe it's, it's easier to explain it here. So we have then the torus. So there's, there's a mapping class group SA to Z. There's a, um, this T uh, matrix, the one uh, Dane twist, and you, the, the action is by acting um, here or here with the uh, ribbon element. And then there's also this, uh, the, the S matrix, and this is the second generator of SA to Z. Um, this is a bit more, this is actually a bit more difficult. But um, yeah, it is, it is very explicit. Yes, I can. I can. Uh, yeah, but it's yeah. It's um, it is it is really um, it's it's pretty tricky. And this is really. I mean, this is really somehow the this was the the, the main idea really of Lubashenko and Majid that they figured this out. And it's it's very non non obvious. Um, yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really good question because it's, this somehow leads to the the, the open problems. Um, so the thing is, um, so what is what is the problem with with these? constructions or why is one not necessarily happy with this. So one thing is that um, in the semi-simple modular case, it's kind of transparent. You have this Rishtik into Reif TFT, then you get the modular functor, and this, this, this makes a lot of sense. And this also makes a lot of sense, but this is much more ad hoc. It's just a thing that works. It's something that is written down in terms of generators and relations. And one thing that is very unclear is whether this, for instance, has a universal property or whether it is actually uh, uh, unique. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is something that you can do, but is it the only thing that you can do? This is not. This is uh, far from clear. Then another problem is that um, these categories that we plug in here, they are rigid. If they are not, if if the categories are not rigid anymore, you lose everything. There's basically nothing that you can do anymore. This is very unfortunate, and um, somehow the yeah, the, the, the question that is supposed to address all of this is what are all the modular functors? Because if one understands all of them, then one can answer such uniqueness questions. One can see whether there are maybe examples that actually do not come from modular categories. Yeah, because, I'm, I mean, from the terminology, it sounds very uh, tautological that this is maybe like a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but, I mean, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not clear at all. So, uh, yeah, I have to clean the board. Uh, I will, yeah. Realization um, of modular functors. Or classification, if you like, this depends a little bit on what what classification uh, means means for you. If somehow, if if in for you, 2D TFTs are classified by commutative Frobenius algebras, then it's a classification in this sense. Of course, you can say, well, we don't know what our commutative Frobenius algebras are, so it's not a classification. But yeah, it's somehow it re-expresses something uh, by something possibly more known. Um, yeah, so we need two other operas for this. And we need what this is is the modular operat of handle bodies. So this is basically the same thing as uh, the surface operat, but we just replace the surfaces with three-dimensional uh, handle bodies. This is actually a little bit easier. Um, and then there is. Another one, and this is framed E2, the framed E2 operat. And uh, yeah, you can think of the framed E2 operat as the restriction of the handle body or the surface operat, it doesn't matter in this case, to genus zero. So it's genus zero surfaces oriented. Um, 
Um, and this is actually, this is the cyclic operand. Okay. And now we can define one auxiliary notion. So we define, to push this up a little bit probably. So we define that an ancilla functor is a modular and the body uh, algebra. And then in the first step, we have to understand these. And so what we prove there is that uh, ancillar functors in S, they're equivalent to cyclic framed E2 algebras in S, and they are also more concretely um, self-dual balanced braided uh, algebras in S. And if here uh, S is Lex, we should go here to the to, to the finite version. Um, these are ribbon, Wotendieck, uh, Verdier categories, as defined by uh, Boyashenko and Grinfeld. And such a Grotendieck Verdier category, what this is, is that. So it's um, so it's it's a it's a category C and it is um, monoidal and balanced braided and it has an object K um, a distinguished object. This is called the dualizing object. And we ask also that the home functors of this form, they are representable by an object called dx, such that the functor sending x to dx is and equivalence. And then there is as for the, yeah, as for the usual ribbon case, there's also a compatibility with uh, the uh, ribbon element. Yeah, so these are um, balanced braided monoidal categories with a weak form of uh, duality. These are not rigid. There are cases, for instance, where the monoidal product is not exact, so they, might not be, they might not even have, um, they, they might not even be rigid, and even if they are rigid, you don't know that somehow this weak duality and the rigid duality are the same. Sometimes, I mean, they might be, but you can also arrange that they're not. And, sorry? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're examples. I mean, they're both, they're, I mean, they're examples coming from, uh, from VOAs, uh, this this, uh, uh, this is an article by Alan Lentner, uh, Schweigert, and, and Wood. They have examples where the monoidal product is not exact. Um, and there are also easier examples where somehow the, the category is still rigid, but where the uh, this, this duality, this D, is not the rigid duality. It's just a different thing, which is, can be twisted by an, an invertible object. Uh, yeah. Okay, and yeah, so if we, if we uh, have this, then we can characterize modular functors because um, the, the idea is somehow, the idea is somehow that if we have something which is already in algebra over the handle body operand, 
then um, the question whether it descends to the, whether it yeah, extends to the surface of that, this is really a property. And this is, this is way more non-obvious than it sounds because you would first say, well, um, if, you, if I have the handle body operate, then I know what are the Dehn twists. So, so either the relations in the mapping class group are satisfied or they're not. So it's just a property. But the thing is that you, you also assign to different uh, handle bodies, I mean, different conformal blocks, and those are not canonically identified. Um, so this, this, this argument really, the, the, the argument that, that, um, that the handle body groups taken together, generate the mapping class group, is of course important, but it, it is actually not a full, full argument. And what we need is somehow really in a statement that the, ex the space of extensions of an ancillar functor to a modular functor, that this is a contractible space. And this is somehow a generalization of this um, anderson Weno theorem, who say that, that um, modular functor is determined by the genus zero data. So they do this in a much more restricted setting, also with the um, yeah, with a in a, in a semi-simple setting, also with a different inequivalent uh, definition of of a modular functor. But yeah, a result like this, this is the thing that you need. Uh, so how does this um, how does this work? So we consider the. Uh, Factorization homology with coefficients in uh, A, and this A, this is now, um, this is a cyclic framed E2 algebra, but then also it is equivalent to an ancillar functor, as we just And what this is, um, I will not be able to say too much uh, about factorization homology itself, but this, this is a sort of homology theory. So this E2 algebra, here we don't really need that it's cyclic, we just need that it's framed and E2. This can be, in a sense, integrated over an oriented uh, surface. This is going to be an object in, uh, in S. And here, this S, this will satisfy some mild assumptions. The monoidal product needs to commute with co-limits and so on and so forth. If, if S is rect, this is fulfilled. So for practical purposes, it uh, doesn't play too much of a role. And this factorization homology, this is somehow, it, this is determined by saying that on a two-dimensional disk, it is just A plus a property that is called excision. So it's a homology theory, so it's local, and we can compute things via gluing. And I will say, I, I won't say too much about uh, about that, but it's it's explicitly computable. And in this two-dimensional case, the, the computations that you you need here, this has all been done by uh, Ben Swibrosh here and Jordan. And now, what you do is the following. So you take um, a handle body H, and you require that the boundary of this is the surface sigma. And now you define a map like this. And we call this map I A of H. And for so for every uh, disk embedding, what you use here is literally just the ancillar functor. Ah, sorry. N is the number uh, of boundary components of sigma. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it 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 doesn't it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's. Uh, 
this is the number of this is the number of boundary components and whether you want to see one of these boundary components as an output is up to you yeah 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 and yeah so this is this is defined uh, via the the ancillar functor and this is so this one and this one so these are actually modules over the algebra that we obtain by integrating A over the boundary of the surface cross R. So if you have factorization a homology, which is something uh, Koda mentioned one, and then you fill up with one R factor, this is an algebra. These two will then be modules over um, this algebra. And in fact, so uh, phi A of H is a module map. And then the last thing that we need to do is that we define omega A of uh, sigma, and this is the full Yes, this is the, it's, it's actually, I mean, a priori it is the, the, the co-center, it's the, the hosted homology, but it is, yeah, exactly. Yes, it's, it's n copies, it's n copies of the co-center and acts on n copies here, yeah. Yeah, so so um, what you what you do? I mean, th this is a this factorization homology. This is a co-limit over, um, yeah, all of the disk embeddings in this surface, and and then it's um, you have in order to map out of this co-limit, you need to map out consistently out of all of these summons. This will be, um, I mean, so first of all, they do this only under the assumption that this A is a, is a rigid braided category. In this case here, it's, it's really not, so this result won't hold. So, but if it holds, then this will be uh, tensoring with a certain uh, bimodule over this, this, this algebra. So then it has also an interpretation in terms of these modular algebras, but generally there is, there is none. Um, so yeah, we have to define the full subgroupoid of um, yeah the module maps. From the factorization homology to A C N uh, stand by D phi A H and H is here just such that uh, the boundary of um, H is uh, sigma. And then, so we say that um, A is connected if all the groupoids that we define here um, are connected. Yes. It's okay because the um, the boundary components here, they are not really implemented as, as boundary components what one typically uh, uh, does, and this is not something that we did, but for instance, in these works of Gian Siracusa, you, you consider them here as just embedded disks. You take a handle body uh, with an embedded, with embedded disks, and then upon taking the boundary, these are converted to actual boundary components of the surface. So you don't really have to say something about manifolds with corners, so that you don't, you don't have to do that. But it's a, it's a good point, actually. I, I, um, I could, but the, in, when I draw this, the, the, the handle body and the surface, they would just literally look the same.
I mean, yeah, okay, but if you, I mean, if you have, for instance, uh, a genus uh, one, so this is now this is now filled, yeah, this is like the, the filled version, the inner filling, and um, I have here an embedded parameterized uh, disk in the boundary of this handle body. This is somehow the datum, and now I want to take the boundary of this um, of this handle body, and I say it's a surface, and now this is just a boundary component. So it, there's really yes, it's a decor. Yeah, in the on the uh, level of the handle bodies and the boundary components that they are yeah they're a decoration. They are yeah embedded disks. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. And now, so the um, the theorem is that yeah. So the moduli space of modular functors is equivalent to the two groupoids of connected cyclic framed P2 algebra. So this is the property that you need. And now I didn't really tell you how you define the moduli space of uh, modular functors. So the only non-trivial thing that is entering there is that you have to, you also want to consider extensions and you want to consider modular functors as the same if you are modeling it over a certain extension and it factors to say, uh, say a smaller one, then those are the same, obviously. Yeah? So you, you have to do a certain localization there, and this is not, not so super critical. But um, yeah, so this is the property that you, that you need. And now let me maybe just in the last two minutes or so, let me just say in words, um, how this addresses the, these questions that I have mentioned. So, um, I mean, this abstract result here, um, okay, maybe th that, I mean, of course, that's, that's also interesting, but somehow the, the more important thing is that we have also a sufficient condition for this. And this is the property of cofactorizability as defined by Poitier Jordan, Safonov, and Snyder. Um, and this is, a pro this is sufficient for this. Modular categories are an example of this. Yes, yeah, so if, if uh, modular categories, they are cofactorizable, and then they um, they give rise to a modular functor, and then we have uniqueness results for extensions from genus zero to all surfaces, and can then conclude that this is Yubashenko's modular functor. So we give a, mo a universal property this, we characterize it as the unique thing that you can do, which from the Lubashenko construction is not obvious. And we have also examples that do not come from uh, modular categories. For instance, the Feigen Fuchs boson of, uh, from this paper of Ellen Lentner, Schweigert, and Wood. This is a category which is not modular, but it gives also rise to a modular functor. And uh, another example that we have is the Drinfeld tensor of a pivotal finite tensor category. This is something which is, uh, has a non-degenerate braiding, um, but it's actually not ribbon. So it's also, you can't apply Lubashenko's construction to this. So there are actually categories that give rise to a modular functor that are not really modular categories in this traditional uh, form. And then of course we want to have more interesting things. We want to have um, maybe examples where the tensor product is, uh, is really non-exact. Non and yeah, there's an algebraic condition that you can uh, that you can uh, check, and yeah, I think that's that's it. Thanks. <laughs>